Hi, I'm Beck Barzanti, and welcome to the Treated for the Big Stick, a deeper look at President Theodore Roosevelt. But, Mr. Barzanti, wasn't Theodore Roosevelt just an imperialistic pig with a blatant disregard for the cultures and ideologies different from his own? Well, why should he get his own episode? Really? Do we have to get into this now? Think what you will of Theodore Roosevelt, but you can't deny how complex of a character he was. He was our youngest president, and his presidency didn't have the support of the Republican Party behind it. And yet, he is still seen as one of our most influential presidents to this very day. I think that's fascinating. And today, we'll be exploring Teddy's presidency to examine how his past influenced his beliefs, policies, and actions later in life. Now before we start exploring Teddy's presidency, like any good AP history essay as I'm sure we all know, we must begin with some context. In this case, the early life of Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt Jr. was born in New York City on October 27, 1858, to parents Theodore Roosevelt Sr. and Martha Roosevelt. Now Theodore Sr. was a very healthy, strong man and doting father. He cared immensely for the less fortunate, both physically and financially. The Roosevelts were a very wealthy family, but they did not hesitate to help others. Theodore Sr. dedicated much of his adult life to teaching at mission schools or founding the Children's Aid Society, an organization dedicated to giving homeless children a job in Western farms and other charitable acts of life. Teddy's father was one of the most influential men in New York, even at the time of his birth, when Theodore Sr. was only 27 years old. In Theodore's own words, his father was the best man I ever knew, but he was the only man of whom I was really afraid. Martha Roosevelt, called Mitty by those close to her, was almost completely opposite to Theodore Sr., where he was strong and manly. Mitty was described by biographer Edmund Morris as feminine to the point of caricature. Martha grew up in a Georgia plantation and held her southern values very close. A doting mother, Martha stayed at home caring for the family while Theodore was working, and she was an excellent storyteller, enrapturing listeners with her great tales and humor. Theodore Jr. and his siblings, Anna, Elliot, and Corinne Roosevelt, all enjoyed very prosperous, caring childhoods under Theodore Sr. and Martha. Both parents cared for them very much, and cared for each other equally. Even through the Civil War, though both supported different sides, their relationship did not suffer. Now, Theodore Sr. was actually called to war. However, he sent a substitute in his place because he could not kill the Confederates whom his wife and her family held so dear. This was a decision that haunted Theodore Sr. and Theodore Jr. alike later on in life. Eventually, Theodore Sr. could not sit idly by without helping the Northern cause. Theodore Sr. proposed a bill to Washington that set up an unpaid allotment commissioners who would travel from camp to camp and persuade Union soldiers to set aside government funds for their families back home. All throughout his life, Theodore Jr. always idolized his father. In many ways, everything he did was to gain his father's approval. So when his father went away as one of the proposed commissioners, Teddy fell seriously ill and wasn't the lively child his parents had come to know. Now, young Theodore was born with asthma, but the list of ailments that befell Roosevelt extended far beyond that, and his asthma worsened as well. The other children were not much better, each hosting a comparable list of symptoms to Teddy's. My father, Theodore would write later in life, he got me breath, he got me lungs, strength, life. Now, after Theodore Sr. returned from war, all of the children returned to their lively, active states. But this represents a turning point in Theodore Jr.'s life. From here on out, we can see young Teddy begin developing into the man we know him as today. His sickly nature would later inspire him as a teenager to begin training himself and making himself stronger, practicing what he would later call the strenuous life. His love for the outdoors and adventurous nature came from that of his father. Theodore Sr. would always bring the family on rural vacations in the wilderness, or on mountains, where young Teddy learned to admire the natural beauty of things. So. Theodore Roosevelt's childhood and early adolescence can give us information on the development of his personality, body, desires, and intellect. However, we must look primarily on his later life to see the experiences that shaped the president we know. While this early period includes both domestic and international trips that reinforce Teddy's love of nature or belief in the strenuous life, the events he saw after college led to the actions that brought him into the presidency. 
Theodore's intellect brought him into Harvard College in 1876, where he studied German, natural history, zoology, forensics, and composition. There, he met his first wife, Alice Hathaway Lee, and the two were married in 1880. Again following his father's influential career in philanthropy, Theodore worked in public service after college. In 1882, he was elected to his first position on the New York Assembly, a position he served from 1882 to 1884. This was his first of many positions in the New York governmental system. 1884 represented a turning point in Roosevelt's life, for better and, sadly, for worse. On February 12th, Alice Lee, Theodore's first daughter, was born. And two days after that, Martha Roosevelt passed away due to typhoid fever, and just a few hours later, in the very same house, his wife died due to Bright's disease, a kidney disease. On the day of their deaths, Theodore wrote, The light has gone out of my life. In grief, Theodore surrounded himself in politics and tried to push all memory of Alice, whom he so dearly loved, out. After many of his proposed bills were vetoed by Governor Grover Cleveland and tensions rose over the Republican presidential candidate, Theodore fled west out to the Dakota Badlands, leaving Alice Lee in the care of his sister Anna. Teddy intended to live the rest of his life on that frontier as a cowboy. From 1884, when he left New York, on to 1886, he made his own life as he had from childhood on. He owned two ranches and about a thousand cattle and became much of a frontier sheriff living on his own, free to hunt, hike, and ride to his heart's content. But all good things must come to an end, including Theodore Roosevelt's bout as a cowboy. He would return to his ranches for many years to follow, but after a particularly hard winter in 1886 that nearly wiped out all of his cattle, Roosevelt returned back to New York with his second wife, a childhood sweetheart, Edith Kermit Caro. Roosevelt and Caro raised six children, Alice Lee, whom they picked up from Anna upon returning to New York, and five of their children whom they had together. Upon returning to New York, Theodore resumed his civil activism by campaigning unsuccessfully for mayor of New York. Two years later, he campaigned vigorously for Benjamin Harrison's presidency, who appointed him to the Civil Service Commission after emerging victorious, a position he resumed under Grover Cleveland in 1893. Roosevelt would eventually leave the Civil Service Commission in 1895 to become the president of the New York City Police Board. Here, Roosevelt's untimely honesty and stubbornness continued as he removed corrupt police officials from power and went to great lengths to enforce the law. During his time as commissioner, we begin to see the Roosevelt that took the presidency take charge. He enforced numerous civil service laws, often causing him to clash with his own party on the grounds of justice versus patronage. Now it's very important to look at this period from 1888 to 1900, as here we see Teddy's rise to power as he assumes higher and higher positions. 1897 won him the support of President McKinley, who appointed him to the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Just one year later, the battleship Maine was struck and the Navy was put on high alert. Soon after, the Spanish-American War began. Now the war was the time for Teddy to show his stripes and do what his father never did, fight for his country with his own flesh and blood. He resigned as Assistant Secretary of the Navy and donned his famous hat and volunteered as the commander of the 1st U.S. Volunteer Cavalry, which we lovingly dubbed the Rough Riders. And I just so happen to have that very same hat here, and I intend to leave it on until this segment is over. What? No, I don't look stupid. I am an American hero! The Rough Riders were a hodgepodge of cowboys, Native Americans, Ivy League gentlemen, prospectors, police officers, and everyone in between. Teddy led the Rough Riders like no commander ever could. In Cuba, he led the charge up Kettle Hill towards the San Juan Heights, shouting words of encouragement from horseback as the men charged into battle and valiantly took the heights, driving the Spaniards back and raising the American flag high for the world to see. God, I get excited just thinking about it. Roosevelt returned home a national war hero, receiving the Medal of Honor for his bravery in the battles of Santiago and San Juan Heights. We can largely attribute Roosevelt's popularity and eventual rise to power to the Rough Riders and his celebrity status that came from it. Now, after the Rough Riders, Roosevelt's next big move was running for the governor of New York, with the Republican Party of New York at his back. With the help of party boss Thomas C. Platt, Roosevelt edged out his opponent Augustus Van Wyck and won the election. After assuming the office of governor, Roosevelt was his own man. 
He paid no mind to party regulars and refused to appoint officials to important positions, such as the Public Works Commission. Roosevelt supported many controversial unorthodox bills and did not bend to the whim of the party bosses. This ended his relationship with Platt, who conspired with National Party boss Mock Hanna to afford him to the vice presidency in order to keep him from running for a second term as governor. Isn't it funny how things turned out? As they say, hindsight is always 2020. In the 1900 election, the Republicans appointed Theodore Roosevelt as McKinley's running mate. He campaigned adamantly for McKinley, traveling all over the country and speaking to millions of people to drum up support for the cause. In the words of a press columnist, Mr. Dooley, who, for some reason to make some social commentary, wrote with an Irish accent, "'Tis Teddy alone that's running, and he ain't running, he's galloping." In the end, the Republicans swept the Democrats in the 1900 election with McKinley receiving almost one million more votes than William Jennings Bryan. And we conclude our story, which was arguably started in the same way, with a death. In September of 1901, McKinley was assassinated in Buffalo, New York. Thus, because he was the vice president, that damned cowboy, according to Mark Hanna, was our president. At just 42 years old, Theodore Roosevelt was our youngest president. This wasn't his only unique quality, however. Teddy Roosevelt is, to me, one of the most interesting presidents we've ever had. <laughs> interesting in a good way, in a good way. He's not a Trump interesting, a damn it, I told myself it wasn't gonna go there. Roosevelt's intense honesty and individuality set him apart from all other presidents of his time. His presidency largely ushered in the progressive era with his support for labor instead of big business and the way he dealt with things more hands-on. Oh, it's time for the enigmatic scripture? I was really hoping you'd forgotten it this time. The rules here are simple. I guess the author of the mist of enigmatic scripture, or I get shocked by this shock pen. Let's see what we've got. One of the fundamental necessities in a representative government such as ours is to make certain that the men to whom the people delegate their power shall serve the people by whom they are elected and not the special interests. I believe that every national officer, elected or appointed, should be forbidden to perform any service or receive any compensation, directly or indirectly, from interstate corporations, and a similar provision could not fail to be useful within the states. The object of government is the welfare of the people. The material progress and prosperity of a nation are desirable chiefly so long as they lead to the moral and material welfare of all good citizens. Just in proportion as the average man and woman are honest, capable of sound judgment and high ideals, active in public affairs, but first of all sound in their home, and the father and mother of healthy children, whom they bring up well, just so far and no farther may we count our civilization a success. Well, based on our topic of discussion for today, I think it's really hard to know who the author is, huh? Alright, well that's only half the battle. Knowing it is Theodore Roosevelt talking about our government's goals, it seems to me that this is post-1900. And his views of the government are different from that was before him, and I know what this is. I will not be needing this. Theodore Roosevelt, the new nationalism. Yeah. Theodore Roosevelt's new nationalism speech really sums up his ideas for the presidency. He thought the president and the entire US government should be for the people and not select special interest groups like his predecessors. This really set him apart from the other presidents and encouraged him to pursue his own codes of values over those presented to him, as he did throughout his entire political career. Now, with our knowledge of Teddy's prior life, let's start connecting the dots here. His whole political career would not have been started without his fame from commanding the Rough Riders. And because his father was so committed to his country, yet never fought in the Civil War, Teddy wanted to do what his father never did and stand up for his cause with his own flesh and blood. Now, like many aspects of his life, a lot of Teddy's presidency can be traced back to his father. Many of his actions against big business can be seen as philanthropic, and these actions were likely inspired by his father's use of power to help those less fortunate. Though his imperialism is a controversial and seemingly hypocritical topic, I don't think it's unreasonable to believe that Teddy genuinely thought he was making people's lives better by exposing them to the American lifestyle. He was a patriot down to a T, and we can see that through his vigorous campaigning for Harrison and McKinley. I think he truly believed in the American cause and thought that extending it to other parts of the world would be purely beneficial. 
Now, a lot of his conservation efforts and in-your-face, hands-on attitude can be attributed to many things, one of which being his time on the ranch, and another one being his love of nature from early childhood and all the adventures that his father would bring him and the family on. He was always a stubborn child. His trip to France in early adolescence taught him how to better his own body and make himself into the strong man we see him as today. He wanted to promote the self-made lifestyle and the strenuous life for all people. But he was not opposed to helping people get to the point where they could help themselves. His ideas of masculinity and femininity were defined by his parents, who were both the epitome of their respective roles. However, like his father, he did not look down on women or those below him. He instead treated them with a certain amount of respect, and he saw himself in a position of power and thought it was his job to help others. And in a lot of ways, he used the progressive movement to do that. Roosevelt had people to do things for, be that Alice Lee, his six children, his siblings, or his parents. And the death of his father, mother, and Alice Lee all represented insecurities for him. His sickly nature and numerous ailments did as well, and I don't think it's unreasonable to say he was overcompensating for these insecurities with his boisterous masculine poise and stubborn attitude. So, while some of his decisions may be questionable, Theodore Roosevelt paved the way for many presidents to come, and without his two terms of service, I think we can all agree the world would be a much different place. In order for us to prosper today, somebody had to start the trust-busting trend, support the muckrakers and investigate the scandals they brought to light, and protect our environment from special interest groups. There's a nice Sunday Globe political cartoon that sums up the necessity of Theodore's policies in a nice way when we look back. A nauseating job, but it must be done. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time I have a history project. The tree that bore the big stick was made possible by Nantucket High School, Adobe Spark, my AP history teacher, Peter Panchi, and all of the authors of the fine sources you can see here. The video for my inspiration was taken shamelessly from Crash Course US History, something all of us students know very well. The comments portion at the end of this video is free and open for you to ask any questions on the material you saw today. Thanks for watching, and as they say in my hometown, if it isn't made public, I can't suffer the consequences of a shameless ripoff.